Professor Chris Stringer was a graduate of UCL and has worked at the Natural History Museum London since 1973. He is now research leader in human origins and a fellow of the Royal Society and is also a visiting professor at Royal Holloway and UCL. His early research was on the relationship of Neanderthals and early modern humans in Europe, but through his work on the recent African origin theory of modern human origins, he now collaborates with archaeologists, dating specialists, and geneticists in attempting to reconstruct the evolution of modern humans globally. He has published over 250 scientific papers. His recent books include The Complete World of Human Evolution, The Origin of Our Species, and Britain, One Million Years of the Human Story. Wow. Uh, Professor Stringer, welcome to Eurotrash. Oh, thank you for having me. Preparing for this interview, I read your wonderful uh, column in The Guardian. It's called Out of Africa, My Lifelong Mission to Trace the Origins of Humanity. In it, you write about how you became an anthropologist dedicated um, to exploring our origins. But you also describe your first research trip that, took, um, that you took in the 70s to study Neanderthal uh, specimens, I believe, right? In the article, there's a cool picture of you drying your clothes beside your car somewhere in Yugoslavia, which is the country where I was born ah. uh, about a decade later. Uh, so yeah. I was thinking before we go on to discuss hominins, could you perhaps talk a little bit about your adventures in Eastern Europe? Uh, because apparently there were quite a few. Yes, yeah, so this trip, uh, 1971, uh, of course, then we were in the Soviet era. Yep. So uh, things were very different in Eastern Europe. Um, and I took myself on a trip around uh, 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 over a dozen European countries with my old car. Uh, lasted five months. I did about 5,000 miles. Uh, so that's 8,000 kilometers. Um, and... Uh, yeah, it was for someone who'd hardly left Britain and really had only minimal French as any foreign language. It was uh, it was quite a challenge. It's something I would never even think about. If I think back now, I, I don't know how I, the, the courage of youth, uh, the foolishness of youth that I even attempted to do it. It seemed, looking back, it was crazy. It, it worked as well as it did. So, yeah, so I, I wrote ahead to all these museums uh, across Europe, including in Eastern Europe, for permission to study their fossils of early uh, Homo sapiens and, and Neanderthals and any other interesting fossils they had that were relevant. And uh, many of them answered back quite politely. Some said that I couldn't come. Um, and so I planned the trip accordingly. And yes, so I was going, I abandoned going into East Germany. There was no cooperation there, but Czechoslovakia, as it was then, um, I entered there. And unfortunately, at the date of entry, uh, was, it was very unlucky. It was the third anniversary of the uh, Soviet invasion of uh, Czechoslovakia. So this was a very tense day to be there anyway. Um, and I turned up in my old car with my long hair and beard and uh, looking, yeah, probably not very tidy. Um, and my old car and these border guards in Czechoslovakia, obviously they looked at all my papers and my passport and they said, yeah, you, you, you can't come in. And I I showed them the, the letter from the... Uh, National Museum in Prague and from the uh, Anthropology Museum in Brno. And they said, uh, they looked at these and said, uh, your visit is of no benefit to the people of Czechoslovakia. <laughs> so that was it. And they also had got me to unpack my whole car. So they wanted everything unpacked. So I had strewn the whole contents of the car all over the road. And they just said, no, uh, you can't come in. Sorry, that's it. And they just left me there, you know, to repack my car. So I had to pick up all this stuff and I was repacking it thinking, wow, you know, that's uh, that's a week gone out of my schedule now uh, when I'm not going to be there. And all the other dates will be out of sequence because I'm – so I was pretty despondent and I'd nearly finished uh, repacking. And meanwhile, they were watching some European football game on their tiny little black and white television in the border post. And then they kind of came out and said, uh, with my passport, and they said, okay, uh, we changed our mind. Uh, you look like Comrade Che, so we're going to let you in. So because they said I look like Che Guevara, somehow this random thing, I got in Czechoslovakia. So I was able to study the fossils there. That was great. Um, 
And then I went through uh, into uh, Austria and eventually came into what was then Yugoslavia and headed to the National Museum in, in Zagreb, as it was. And there there'd been this uh, really prominent anthropologist in the early 1900s called Janovic Kramberger. And he was the guy who had described these wonderful Neanderthal fossils from a site called Krapina, uh, spelt with a K, Krapina, Krapina. Maybe I pronounce it wrongly. You can correct me. Um, anyway. Oh, good, no. Really <laughs> so, good. Yeah. And the incredible thing was uh, his office had been preserved like a kind of museum from those early 1900s. So unfortunately, the, the director of the museum wasn't there. So his assistant looked at the letter and said, okay, you can come in and you're one of the very few people who's allowed to study these fossils. They're hardly studied. So they took me into his office, which was beautifully preserved from the 1900s, and they brought in these old wooden boxes with the crap and the fossils. And, you know, I started to unpack them and measure them. Um, and the sad thing was that I had, a, I had an unfortunate accident with one of the fossils. So one of the most well-preserved fossils, which was a face, and a skull of a, a Neanderthal, crap in the sea. Did you drop it? Uh, well, I didn't drop it. It was nearly as bad. So <laughs> for my measurements, I had to put these instruments on various points to measure the s dimensions of the fossil. And I had calipers that were a little bit sharp. And when I put them into this position on the skull, and I, I've got you a – here's a Neanderthal skull here. I can oh, show you exactly awesome. yes. what I was doing. Here's a replica of a Neanderthal fossil here. So – um, let me just put my headphone back in. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, so I put the calipers here and here to measure across the uh, breadth of the orbits, and the face just fell off with a clunk onto the desk. The jaw just fell the off. Jaw, the, whole, the whole face separated here and here and and fell onto the desk separate from the skull. Were you alone in the room uh, or yeah, was I somebody my, supervising uh, my, you? My then girlfriend was with me uh, and we were just horrified. So the thing had <laughs> fallen apart. And there were these old glue joints, probably animal glue from the nineteen from 1910 or something, and they'd become very dry. So putting the calipers in here, the thing just separated with a clunk into two pieces. And I was just horrified. This was this precious fossil. So, uh, you know, what do we do? And I didn't have any glue with me. Otherwise, I would have fixed it then and tried to pretend nothing had happened. So I had to go to this poor curator, the assistant curator, <laughs> and tell him what had happened. And he could see his his own career wrecked. He let me get these precious fossils, and I'd had this accident. So we said to him, look, you know, if we can find some glue, we, may, we can probably fix it. It will look as good as new. So that's what happened. So we went out. We got some good Yugoslavian glue and we glued the pieces back together again and all was well and he was relieved and we said we won't tell anyone you know this is it it's all fine and the interesting thing is I don't know probably maybe five years later uh, another a colleague I knew who was going to crap and he went there five years later to study the same fossils and when he came back, I met him and he said, I heard this terrible story. He said, I said, what, what, what? He said, well, some student broke the crap in a sea fossil, <laughs> you know, and they had to glue it together again. I said, well, that's, that's terrible. That's terrible. Uh, any idea who it was? He said, yeah, apparently some American student. I was so relieved at that point, you know. So, yeah, now you know the truth about that one. So, yeah, so... So, um, yeah, lots of adventures. I got robbed in Rome and robbed again in Avignon, so stuff was stolen. I ended up just with the dirty washing that they left in my laundry bag to wear for the for the last three weeks of my trip. Um, but, yeah, I, I managed to gather data on uh, on most of the fossils I wanted to study, and then I came back to Bristol, which is where I was doing my PhD, to actually start putting the data together. And it was testing whether Neanderthals made good ancestors for Homo sapiens, which was the leading idea at the time. I'm surprised they let other foreigners in after your mishap. <laughs> well, that's right. Yes, yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Um, all right. Um, we were always kind of led to believe that the evolution of ancient humans uh, progressed in a kind of a linear fashion. You know, uh, that we went from the early, I don't know, let's say Homo habilis, the, the so-called handyman, right, to modern humans in a continuous fashion, almost like in a straight 
line. When a new hominin species evolved from the previous one, that's what they told us, um, you know, they took over and that was that. However, this picture has been turned on its head and we know that there were many different hominins. Is it hominins or hominids? Yes, hominin. Hominin hominins. for us and our closest yeah. relatives. Yeah. Right. They were living on Earth at the same time, all of these diff different hominins, right? Um, it was also simple once. What happened? Yeah, so... Um, even 70,000 years ago, which is like yesterday, geologically speaking, there were at least five kinds of humans around on the earth. So we had been evolving in Africa, Homo sapiens. The Neanderthals had been evolving in Europe and Asia. Uh, over in Eastern Asia, there were these Denisovans that we learned about in the yeah. last 10 years or so. Um, and on the islands of Southeast Asia, there's this weird little dwarf species called Homo floresiensis. So the Hobbit, the, right? The Hobbit, yep. Yeah. And Homo luzonensis on the Philippines. So there are at least five kinds of humans around. Possibly there were more in Africa that we still don't know much about even then. And now we're the only one. So within another 40,000 years, all those others had gone as far as we know, and there was just us. So that's, that's one so of the trippy. big... Yeah. Un outstanding questions is what happened to those other species? Uh, did, were we involved in their disappearance or, or did they die out for other reasons? So that is one of the big questions. And the interesting thing is if we go further back in time, that pattern of diversity is there right through human evolution. It's like nature is almost experimenting in how to make a human. And there are all these different lineages and the rest of them end up going extinct uh, at least physically extinct. And obviously we can come onto the question of the fact that even Neanderthals and Denisovans haven't totally disappeared because, of course, before they disappeared, they interbred with our ancestors. And so you and I are partly Neanderthal. We have a bit of Neanderthal DNA in our genomes from their interbreeding maybe 50,000 years ago. So, yeah, things are much more complex. Uh, when I did my PhD, yeah, you're, you're right. It was These were these very simple stories of single lines of evolution, uh, one stage leads on to another. Uh, and uh, it's a kind of progression uh, towards our, our wonderful species, Homo sapiens. And we know it certainly wasn't a, a linear progression. It was complicated. And even our so-called success now, if you can call it that, change a few parameters and, and we probably wouldn't be here now. Maybe Neanderthals would have carried on the story. Who knows? That's fascinating. Um, what is the so-called out of Africa theory that you've been researching? Yeah, so in fact, there were a number of out of Africa. So Africa, because it was the largest inhabiting continent, it, it's been you know very important in human evolution. So Africa seems to be like a laboratory that creates species, and and some of them left Africa. So probably the first five million years or so of human evolution, as far as we know, took place only in Africa. So the split from chimpanzees, our closest living relatives, almost certainly happened in Africa. Um, and then we had these lines of evolution, because the chimpanzees must have had lines of evolution too, about which we know very little. But we have these creatures which are on the human line. And by the time we get to about 2 million years ago, there's a species called Homo erectus. And that species um, is the first one that we know of for sure that left Africa. And it spreads into Asia uh, probably into Europe uh, soon after that as well, down into right across Asia and into Southeast Asia. So we find Homo erectus fossils in Africa, in uh, Western Asia, over in China, down in uh, Java, in Indonesia. So that species, that's like what's called out of Africa one. Uh, and there probably were more out of Africa events after that as species came out. And of course, it isn't all one way. You know, there probably were some into Africa events as well that we don't know much about. And then we come to the last couple of hundred thousand years and Homo sapiens by then has evolved in Africa and Homo sapiens also starts to emerge from Africa. So that's the out of Africa theory that people mostly think of, the spread of Homo sapiens from its African homeland to the rest of the world. Um, so that's the one that I've probably you know, helped in developing this idea that we did have a recent African origin. Uh, and there are other ideas still around that uh, some people subscribe to a multi-regional model, which suggests that actually Homo erectus uh, did not die out in other regions, even in, in Europe, in Africa, in China, in Java. In all those areas, Homo erectus carried on evolving towards Homo sapiens.
And on that view, <coughs> we can trace, let's say, the origin of native Australians back to over a million years ago in Java. <coughs> and we can trace the evolution of recent Asian people like Chinese people. Their ancestors go back to Homo erectus in China a million years ago. The ancestors of Homo sapiens in Europe were in Europe a million years ago and African ancestors were in Africa a million years ago. So that's the multi-regional model. That's kind of one extreme. We've got the recent African origin model that says, actually there was only one place where there was a line of evolution from early humans through to Homo sapiens. That was in Africa. And then we came out and we, as we've said, somehow we replaced these other species outside of Africa that had evolved outside of Africa. Um, and that's the classic out of Africa theory. And it suggests that the regional variation we find today in Europe, in China, in, uh, in Australia, in Africa, that's a recent, recently evolved thing. So a hundred, let's say 200,000 years ago, there were none of these regional variants of Homo sapiens that we find today. They are recently evolved. Mostly, most of our regional features that characterize people today have evolved in the last 50,000 years. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a bit of a stupid question, but I'm going all in here. I'm sure I'm, sure I'm not the only person who's wondering this. What does an evolutionary jump in humans like look like? Is there a, is there suddenly a whole generation of babies being born that just look different and are clearly a new species, or does it happen sort of gradually, bit by bit, with new physical attributes slowly emerging? I have I've always wondered this. I blame the education system for making these things yeah, sure. so abstract. Yes, so I mean, some evolutionary changes. If we look at the bigger picture. Um, can occur very rapidly. Um, but in humans, as far as we know from the fossil record, most of these changes look fairly gradual. So if we look at the African record of Homo sapiens evolution, um, we have fossils 300,000 years old, which show a few features that would characterize Homo sapiens today. So I've got a skull here, which uh, oh, nice. you can see this is, a, this is a Homo sapiens, a replica of a Homo sapiens fossil. And so we're characterized by this high and rounded brain case and small brow ridges at the front, a small face that's tucked under the brain case. Um, if we had the lower jaw, there'd be a, a nice chin on the lower jaw. Um, our ear bones, if we had CT scans, we could see inside the ears and the little ear bones inside are also distinctive in Homo sapiens. And we look at our skeleton, a skeleton is lightly built with a, a narrow rib cage, a narrow pelvis, and so on. So those features characterize Homo sapiens. And if we look at the evolution in Africa, the interesting thing is that there are some fossils, as I say, at 300,000 years that have some of those features, but not all of them. And when we get to about 200,000 years, we start to see fossils that show most of those characters. And one of the uncertainties at the moment is, did those features evolve fairly suddenly uh, in one group or did they evolve gradually over a long period of time and unfortunately the African fossil record is not complete enough and it's not well dated enough for it to really answer that question so mostly evolution seems to in humans seems to go gradually so the evolution of the Neanderthals in Europe and Asia seems to if we look at the fossil record seems to show a gradual build-up of features for Homo sapiens the record in Africa is not good enough to really see mm -hmm. if that's the process that's going right. on. But certainly it's a long process. Our evolution in Africa took probably half a million years. So that's a long time. The Neanderthals would have evolved over the same time scale. And people over in Asia, in Eastern Asia, probably there's a separate line of evolution there over the same time scale. And Homo erectus carried on evolving in Indonesia for probably over a million years. So these right, are another, long another, stories. Right. Another naive question. Yeah. Um, we're all we're in all shapes and sizes, homo sapiens. I walk down the street here in Berlin, you know, tall people, short people, whatever, different features. How do we know once we find uh, a skeleton or something that it's not just a funny looking homo sapiens, that it's a yeah, different that's a very species? good question. And um, we talked about Homo floresiensis, this hobbit on the on the island of yeah. Flores in Indonesia. Some people, and maybe even today, there are some people that still think it's some weird variant of Homo sapiens. They think that 
it's probably a, a homo sapiens with some disease that made it yeah. very small and small brained. So yeah, it is it is a good question. How do we know these are different species? And uh, for me, the the measure of variation that we find in primates today is the guide. So we have to look at variation in chimpanzee skeletons, in gorilla skeletons, um, in skeletons of baboons that are different species that they you know we look at them in nature. We see that they're distinct. They have distinct evolutionary histories. We regard them as distinct species. So that's the measure that we try and use when we look at the fossils. So that was what I, for my PhD, I had a, a, a database of hundreds of skulls of modern humans from around the world, from Australia, from China, from Europe, from Africa. And I used that as my baseline, if you like, to tell me what a Homo sapiens should be. And I could find fossils 50,000 years ago and 100,000 years ago that fitted that categorization. So there were some in Israel, which we now know are 100,000 years old. Those fitted my characterization of Homo sapiens based on the variation today. But when we came to Neanderthals, they were like two or three times as different as that variation we find today. So for me, that put them outside of Homo sapiens. Um, and Homo erectus was even further away. Okay. So, yeah. So yeah. It, it's a relative thing and it's a judgment, of course, because we don't know for sure. And then maybe like you at school, I was told that species are characterized by not interbreeding with each other. So that was, this is the so-called biological species concept. Species are reproductively isolated. They don't interbreed with each other. So, of course, if you apply that to the fossils, as I've said, we now know that uh, you and I have Neanderthal DNA in our, in our genome. So we interbred with Neanderthals. So on that basis, they should be the same species as us. But of course, that's where the species concept gets complicated because, you know, nature, you know, we create these species concepts and nature doesn't play along with them. You know, we, we humans are great classifiers. We like to keep things simple and in categories. But when you look at jackals and wolves, uh, when you look at polar bears and brown bears, they are good species, apparently. But when you look at their genomes, they do a bit of interbreeding. In Africa, there are a number of baboon species. They look like good species. They behave like good species. They have different diets, different coloration. You can distinguish them in the skeleton. But when you look at their DNA, they do a bit of interbreeding. So this is it. It takes a long time in many cases, in mammals and birds in particular, for these species to become reproductively isolated. One or two million years, probably. So we've been separate from the Neanderthals maybe 600,000 years, perhaps similar to polar bears and brown bears. So hybridization, interbreeding was still possible. And the interesting thing is we can see from the interbreeding that happened with Neanderthals that actually there were even some benefits for that interbreeding. Um, we picked up things from the Neanderthals that were useful to us 50,000 years ago. So we had evolved in Africa, and then we came into these new environments in Europe and Asia. And we didn't have immunity to the local diseases, the pathogens, the parasites. The Neanderthals had evolved some of those immunities. So by interbreeding with them, we got a quick fix to our immune systems. And that was good news 50,000 years ago. Medically, not so good news now, because it seems that some of those immune systems that we picked up from Neanderthals are causing autoimmune diseases in humans today. Oh, no. Okay. Because yeah, yeah. I've read a really silly, bizarre article about Ozzy Osbourne, the famous rock star. Yes. Apparently, he did some genetic testing, and they said that one of his Neanderthal genes helped him survive drinking four liters of cognac a day. Does oh, that make well, any well, sense you whatsoever? Yeah. So, yes. I mean, there are, there are Neanderthal genes which in Homo sapiens seem to be linked with addictive behaviors. <clears throat> so this is very strange. Um, if you look at modern genomes and you look at modern characteristics, if you have big enough samples, tens of thousands, uh, even millions of, of genomes, and you look at the behavioral record, you can make correlations between bits of DNA and bits of modern behavior. So there are bits of DNA in the modern genome that have a at least a, a slightly higher percentage of meaning that you are addicted to smoking. You can't give up smoking easily if you've got certain bits of DNA. And the weird thing is when you map where the Neanderthal DNA is in our genomes, some of it comes up in those places. So the suggestion is that if you've got certain bits of Neanderthal DNA, you're going to find it harder to give up smoking. 
you have some addictive traits in your personality. Now, that's weird because there was no tobacco around when Neanderthals were around. They weren't smoking tobacco because it came from the New World. So what it probably tells us is that there's something in Neanderthal DNA that, enc that encourages repetitive behavior. And that may have been good news. Maybe, you know, 50,000 or 100,000 years ago, if you were going to make fire, which is very adaptively useful, you have to be very persistent to keep going until you made the fire. Uh, so it could be something like that. It might also be that there's a slight mismatch between that bit of DNA and our genomes, because, of course, that bit of DNA in the Neanderthals was part of a, a Neanderthal genome. Put it into our genome, which is slightly different. Genes don't work in isolation. So it might be that that, G, that bit of DNA just doesn't work in our genome the way it worked in the Neanderthal genome. So this is all very fascinating, medically important. We know that there are bits of D Neanderthal DNA that give some immunities uh, against COVID and other bits which actually make people more susceptible to having COVID. So again, there, you know, this doesn't mean Neanderthals were dealing with COVID, but they were dealing with other diseases. We've got bits of their immune systems and it's kind of swings around about some bits of DNA are good, some bits are bad. Uh, there's also some bits of Neanderthal DNA that seem to be correlated with, um, in modern humans, with uh, strokes, with thromboses. Hmm. And it's possible the Neanderthals have bits of DNA which encourage the blood to heal quicker. To to Because, you know, life was dangerous in Neanderthal times. Uh, you're using sharp flint tools. Uh, you're dealing with you're, you're dealing with dangerous animals. You're giving birth to children without a lot of medical support. So it may be that they had bits of DNA that encourage the, the blood to clot quicker. That was good news fifty thousand years ago, and we picked it up from them for the interbreeding. Uh, but today, with our lifestyles, uh, it actually seems to be linked with a higher risk of strokes. So yeah, this is really fascinating stuff, and it's. It's something that's only really become important in the last 10 years with this knowledge of the Neanderthal interbreeding and equally Denisovan interbreeding. We haven't got onto Denisovan yet, but that also is going to be important medically as well. So we also have some Denisovan DNA in us. Well, many people do, yes. So um, the Denisovans lived over in the Far East, and we think they probably also lived down in Southeast Asia. So they're known from, of course, their primary site of Denisova Cave in Siberia, and Russian archaeologists have been digging that site for more than 50 years, and they found fragmentary human fossils, impossible to tell what species they were, although there were some very big teeth. And when the DNA was tested about 12 years ago, uh, scientists found that there was a whole genome beautifully preserved in a little finger bone fragment, and it wasn't Neanderthal, it wasn't Homo sapiens, it was something different. And we call that different thing Denisovans. Um, and we now know that... Uh, the Denisovans lived in Denisova Cave probably for a couple of hundred thousand years. They were there long term. We've even got the DNA in the sediments of the cave. So we don't even need their fossils. Even from the sediments of the cave, we have their DNA telling us they were there for a long time. Neanderthals were there some of the time as well. And we even have a girl, a tiny fragment of bone, which is from a girl who lived there maybe a hundred thousand years ago. And her mother was a Neanderthal and her father was a Denisovan. She looks like a first-generation hybrid. So not only were we interbreeding with Neanderthals, but Neanderthals and Denisovans were interbreeding with each other. And when we look where Denisovan DNA is today, just as we can find Neanderthal DNA in pretty well everyone outside of Africa at about 2%, there are populations today that have Denisovan DNA. Uh, Eastern Asians, Native Americans have some, but the largest amounts are found in places like the Philippines, uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, Australia. And that suggests since those the ancestors of those people, as far as we know, never went anywhere near Siberia, it means that there were Denisovan-like people living in Southeast Asia 50,000 years ago. And when Homo sapiens populations came out of Africa and went through that region, they interbred with Denisovans and picked up some of their DNA. And so those populations, if you like, have a double dose of intergressed DNA. They have DNA from Neanderthals, and then added on top of that, there's DNA from Denisovan-like populations. So it's a complicated story. Uh, and the Denisovans, we, we know physically not much about them. We know we've got their whole genomes, but there's a jawbone from the Tibetan Plateau of China, over 150,000 years old, from Jahe, that 
is thought to be Denisovan based on a little bit of protein material extracted from it. And there are fossils in China, um, one from Dali and one I was involved in studying from Harbin, so-called Dragon Man, a beautiful fossil, uh, over 150,000 years old. We don't have its DNA, but it's obviously a distinct kind of human. It's not Neanderthal, it's not Homo sapiens, it's not Homo erectus. So it's possible that that too is a Denisovan. And hopefully one day we will have a really complete fossil with a complete genome and we can really tell who these Denisovans were. But it's likely they are a third lineage. So there was a split maybe 600,000 years ago, uh, the Denisovans, the Neanderthals and us. Yeah. That's such a wild world that we were sharing the planet with four other, at least four other hominid yeah, species. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, were we for how long did we share the planet with these? Well, other we species we co-evolved with those lineages, as I say, probably for five hundred thousand years. Um, it's likely that the Floresiensis lineage and the Lusinensis lineage go back on those islands much further. They may go back a million years. And in the last 500,000 years, yes, we had evolved, the Neanderthals had evolved, they were beginning their evolution, and the Denisovans must have begun their evolution as well, probably, in the last 400,000 years at least. So, so yeah. were we competing with these different species? Not in the or? same areas. Uh, obviously, the evolution of these populations, for them to develop enough separate features, they were geographically separate and reproductively separate that they could right. build up their own separate features. So that was the story most of the time. But now and again, they did come together. And so there's evidence in Europe from over 200,000 years ago um, that there was some kind of interbreeding event uh, between early Homo sapiens and early Neanderthals. Because the interesting thing is, if you look at the whole genome of a Neanderthal and a Homo sapiens, <coughs> Scientists calculate that they separated maybe, as I say, 600,000 years ago. But if you look at the mitochondrial DNA, uh, which is one a tiny bit of DNA that's inherited from mothers to daughters uh, separately, if you look at that, the coalescence date of us and Neanderthals is only about 350, 400,000 years. And if you look at the Y chromosome, which is passed on through males, through, from fathers to sons, if you look at that, again, the coalescence date when we had a common ancestor is around 400,000 years. So that suggests that there was a mixture, maybe three or 400,000 years ago, between early Homo sapiens and early Neanderthals. And that led to intermixture. And the Neanderthals actually acquired from Homo sapiens the mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome DNA. So that's mm. an interbreeding event that we know very little about. There is what looks like a Homo sapiens fossil in Greece from over 200,000 years ago, from a site called Apidima Cave, and I was involved in studying this with Katerina Havati and colleagues. This back of a skull in Apidima Cave is dated at over 200,000 years, and it looks like a Homo sapiens fossil from the back of the skull. Now, it is only the back of the skull. We haven't got the whole skeleton. It's just the back of the skull, but it looks like a Homo sapiens. That could represent one of these populations that came out in a very poorly known dispersal from Africa more than 200,000 years ago, mixed with some Neanderthals, and then disappeared. And so that's the interesting thing is we, we've talked about the replacement of Neanderthals, but it looks like at times you had the reverse process. The Neanderthals actually replaced Homo sapiens at times outside of Europe, so um, outside of Africa. So this success of Homo sapiens in the last 50,000 years, we can call it that, it wasn't preordained. And there were times in the past when Neanderthals, it looks like, actually replaced Homo sapiens in some locations. Whoa. Now, yeah. when a Denisovan and a Neanderthal met each other, let's say, would they know that they're different or not really? Well, they would have looked, they would have looked different, certainly. We know from the available data that they were different. So the teeth size is very different. Denisovans have got very big teeth compared with us and the Neanderthals. Um, and... Their genome suggests that they separated off from Neanderthals more than 400,000 years ago. So they would have looked different. Obviously, if some of these Chinese fossils are, are Denisovans, yeah, they would have looked quite different. So the Harbin fossil, if that was a Denisovan, what it tells us is, yes, the Denisovans were large-brained. They were very large-bodied. Um, they had strong brows like a Neanderthal and a long, low skull like a Neanderthal. But their face looked much more, much more like our face. 
So, so Neanderthals have got a very big nose, um, and the whole middle of the face is pulled forwards. So, whereas in Denisovans, if this Harbin fossil is a Denisovan, it's got a very flat face. It's got delicate cheekbones like a Homo sapiens. So we've got a different mix of features in the Harbin fossil. So that certainly the Neanderthal and the Harbin, if those people met, they would they would look different. Uh, and obviously, genetically, they're separate too. So they have Professor, can you tell from my face if I have more uh, Neanderthal DNA because I have a really big nose? Does that? Is that yeah, like... well, some of us have got big noses as it is, yeah. Um, yeah. But the Neanderthals really did have uh, very big noses and very wide noses. So people today, you find people with high noses and broad noses and very projecting noses. The Neanderthals had all three. That's a unique combination of features. So, yeah, there's nobody today that's got a nose quite like a Neanderthal. <laughs> <Okay>. um, but, <laughs> yeah, you, it's, a, yeah, it's an Thank interesting you. point because people see they've got big brow ridges. I mean, I get letters from uh, – people in the old days i got letters now it's emails saying uh you know i think i've seen a neanderthal or my husband's a neanderthal you know i think my <laughs> husband's a neanderthal you know he's got great big brow ridges and he's very hairy and uh i think would you like to test his dna i, I you know I, I get these kinds of messages um but of course the the physical effects of that DNA are, are, are limited. We know it's influencing our physiology. I've mentioned our immune systems that seem to owe something to Neanderthal DNA. Um, but of course, big brow ridges is not just a Neanderthal feature. That was a, a widespread feature. And the brow ridges we have today are not like Neanderthal brow ridges. Our brow ridges are very modest compared with Neanderthal ones. And our noses, as I say, are only a, a shadow of what a Neanderthal nose would have looked like. Oh right, yeah. I wanted to send you some of um, of the hair of my friend so you can test it because yes. I'm suspecting also that they have a lot of Neanderthal DNA. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, of the tests we've done today on people, yeah, the the variation it tends to be around two percent, plus or minus maybe half a percent. That's the average. I mean, there could be people who've got a little bit more than that, and certainly I've mentioned there are people that have got four percent Denisovan DNA. So. Uh, you know, that's that's more than we find of Neanderthal DNA. Uh, so the phys physically, there could be some effects, but the effects seem to be quite modest at that level of, of DNA. And we know that the DNA of Neanderthals was selected away quite quickly. So we have DNA from early Homo sapiens fossils in Europe that are 25,000, 30,000, 35,000, 40,000 years old. And within 5,000 years of the interbreeding, it looks like the Neanderthal DNA level dropped down quite drastically, quite quickly. Um, a lot of it was selected away. Um, but the bits that remain, obviously some of that may be chance events, but some of it was retained because it was useful. Yeah. How big do we estimate these various populations of hominins were? I read somewhere that there were only about like 20,000 Neanderthals on the planet at any given time. This might be wrong, but with such small numbers, I guess I never yeah. understood why we had to compete with each other. It, the, the earth seems vast with such tiny populations. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I think that, yeah, the population numbers, we really don't have good data on it. Geneticists estimate population numbers from genetic data. And the estimates are that, yes, Neanderthal populations could have been down in the thousands or tens of thousands, you know, maybe a 100,000 in good times, but still very low by modern standards. Homo sapiens in Africa, it's a bigger area, a more area to inhabit and reasonable environments without the effects of the ice ages that really hit the north. Um, population numbers could have been a bit bigger in Africa of Homo sapiens, but we're still talking very small numbers. And you're right, these small numbers of people, the number of Homo sapiens that came out of Africa maybe 60,000 years ago in the main out of Africa event, you could be talking about, you know, some people talk about a thousand people coming out and then basically founding the populations of the rest of the world. So, yes, you would think, well, on those small numbers, when are they even going to meet the Neanderthals? And the fact exactly, is yeah. that a lot of the time they probably didn't meet each other. But when you come to a place like Europe, it's a relatively small area. You've got challenging climates. So at times the climates really deteriorated. And then those populations would be competing with each other economically. So in the less good times or when the populations grow in number in the good times, they are going to come up against each other and they could be competing economically because, of course, both populations are hunter-gatherers. 
They're going to be hunting the same animals. They're going to be collecting the same plant resources. They're going to want to live in the best areas where the, where the game is, where the best cave sites are and so on. So I think that the Neanderthals, the genetic data suggests that they were already in trouble in their last 20,000 years. Their numbers were relatively low. Some of the population seem to have been doing a bit of inbreeding, which is not great for the gene pool, of course, if you're breeding, having to breed with your close relatives. So some Neanderthals were having to do that. So I think that their numbers were low. Their genetic diversity was lower than Homo sapiens today. So they already maybe were a species in trouble. And then a competing species comes along, competing economically with them. And that species perhaps had a small edge in competition maybe slightly better technology. Uh, having the use of sewing needles, for example, would make a big difference in cold environments because you can insulate your babies better. Uh, you can make better tents that are windproof. That gives you a little edge on survival. Uh, Homo sapiens may have lived in slightly larger groups with more networking, and that also would be one of your insurance policies in bad times. So I think it was, you know, we know that Neanderthals were highly capable people, highly intelligent. They survived very challenging conditions for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, but in the end, it could have just been quite small margins that led to them disappearing physically and us going ahead. Um, so it could have been quite a close thing. And I think it's probably a combination of features that in the end led to their physical extinction, but not mm. genetic extinction because they live on, a bit of them lives on in us today. I read a book about cannibalism from a famous zoologist called Bill Shutt um, recently. He's also going to appear on this podcast. And he referenced another anthropologist that said that maybe cannibalism amongst Neanderthals had a hand in, in their demise. Yeah, yeah. So it is interesting that um, cannibalism yeah, happens even in Homo sapiens today. It's not that common, but it does happen. And we've got evidence of what seems to be cannibalism at a number of times in the past in different populations, in different species. So it's Homo antecessor from Spain 850,000 years ago. It looks like there were individuals there that were butchered and eaten. Um, there's possible Homo erectus examples with cut marks on the human bones where they may have been eaten. And of course, in some cases, this could be crisis cannibalism. So, you know, it's a bad winter. Individuals die. And you know, basically, they eat them because they don't have much choice about it. So that could be some of the explanation. But I think there's enough examples in Neanderthals and indeed in early Homo sapiens that it's not that uncommon. And then you come on to explanations of possibly aggression between groups, which mm -hmm. then involves cannibalism. When they, If they kill an enemy, they then eat them. Um, but in some cases, there's also evidence of cannibalism within groups. So as you mentioned, the case of Kuru, where people were eating uh, the remains of their close relatives to kind of keep alive their knowledge, their wisdom, uh, and so on, and eating eating their relatives. So in the case of Neanderthals, I think there's, there's examples of both. There seems to be examples where it could be a, what you call aggressive cannibalism, and in other cases where it's cannibalism within the groups and as you mentioned this can be detrimental uh, you may you know actually pick up viral diseases from eating your your close relatives um, but i think selection will work on that groups that do this to an excess are going to have problems and they will die out and yeah. other groups who don't behave in that exact way will survive so i think selection it's unlikely the whole population could have died out because they were eating each other um, what about the domestication of dogs? Was that a factor? Um, I think not in the time period we're talking about. So the evidence of domestication of dogs is that it came later. There's some suggestions it could have happened 35,000 years ago, uh, but not within the time scale of us and Neanderthals overlapping as far as we know. Of course, if we had have had dogs and Neanderthal didn't, that would have given us a big advantage probably right. in hunting and so on. But the evidence is it came later, yeah. And in fact, there could have been multiple domestications of dogs. It probably wasn't even a single event. It probably happened uh, semi-independently in different parts of the world. But as far as we know, not more than 40,000 years ago. 
All right, um, we're jumping through vast timelines here because we have a limited amount of time. I have so many questions. Um, but eventually, like we said, Homo sapiens kind of outshines everybody else, right? I wanted to ask how tough was the world of your average human before the invention of agriculture? I've read Yuval Harari's uh, Sapiens book, and he says that if you survived infancy, life in these small hunter-gatherer communities wasn't necessarily as brutal as we might imagine. Like a lot of problems such as plagues, wars, poor nutrition, etc., started arising once we settled down and began farming. What do you think of it? Yeah, I, th I think it would have varied. So at times, life would have been uh, pretty good. So in the warm stages, even in places like Europe, um, there was a lot of food around for people who knew how to acquire it. So um, it's still a dangerous world, of course. You know, you're you're out there in a in a place with in Europe. You have lions, hyenas, wolves, bears. Um, these are dangerous places to be. And Neanderthals and our and our early Homo sapiens, they were having to confront those animals to acquire their food. They, that was a risk all the time um, of, of death. And so. You know, there were there were hard times, and when the climate gets cold, it really is very challenging then. Uh, and there's an interesting situation in some Neanderthal sites that people actually mapped in sequences in France when the Neanderthals were building fires in their sites. And the weird thing was, when it got really cold, there didn't seem to be evidence of hearths in those sites. And you think, well, why not? That's the very time they need fire. But the problem is, even having fire has a has a cost because you've got to go out and get that firewood to keep that fire going. And in a very harsh winter, going out to search for firewood for hours could, could kill you. And so these populations sometimes had to make these, these hard choices of assessing the risk and doing something uh, that might kill you or avoiding it and having to do without a fire that night, even though it was bitterly cold. So yeah, at times life is very hard, but at other times, you know, if they were able to get enough plant resources to supplement their diet, even when they didn't kill a, a large animal, if they had good plant resources, they would still have plenty to eat. So we know from modern hunter-gatherers that, uh, you know, life isn't always stressful, that they do have leisure time. Once people had the use of fire uh, and could regularly make it every evening and they got their fuel, they can sit around that fire and actually extend their daylight time. And that's probably when population started to tell stories to each other. They'd be talking about what happened that day, what they're going to do the next day, starting to tell stories about their ancestors. Uh, so the, the presence of fire would have encouraged social bonding, uh, social complexity. Probably it, the evolution of language, complex language, was probably linked with, with these gatherings in the evening of people. So, yeah, these... Neanderthals and Homo sapiens would have had those social situations. Oh, that doesn't sound that bad. No energy bills, uh, no rising costs, no nine to five. Yeah, yeah. But given a bad winter, okay. times could be pretty hard. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Neanderthals, you know, there's this remarkable structure deep in a cave in, in France at Brunichel Cave. So deep in this cave, uh, people discovered uh, these oval structures made of stalagmites deep in a cave, well beyond the daylight zone. So 175,000 years ago, people, and we assume they were Neanderthals, went deep into this cave and built these, they got stalagmites, they broke them to a systematic size, they built dry stone walls and made these oval structures deep in the cave. And we haven't got the faintest idea why they were doing that. Uh, was it just very cold and the cave actually was a milder place to be? Uh, there was running water there, um, but you've got to have you've got to have artificial light to be down there. So they must have had torches and hearths. There's evidence they were burning animal bones down there to produce light and maybe heat. So this is a great mystery. The site hasn't been excavated yet. They're still mapping it and assessing what to do about it. But were they living down there, or was this some kind of weird special structure? That had special meaning for the Neanderthals, but it's 175,000 years old. It shows you the complexity of their lives. Did they have religion? Was that maybe like a little uh, temple? That's a very good question. We don't we don't know. Uh, I think Homo sapiens. Yeah, you know, by the time we get to Homo sapiens, 35, 40,000 years ago, 
Uh, we've got the cave paintings with this great complexity. We've got weird sculptures and depictions that are half man and half animal, not a real creature, a mythical creature. So I think there are the religious beliefs then, but when we get beyond that, I don't know for Neanderthals uh, and, yeah, right. and even for early Homo sapiens in Africa. I, I okay. would say I, I I can't answer that one. You need an archaeologist on maybe who, who's willing yeah. to speculate about that. Um, when you find bones of these ancient humans, what's can we talk about an average age and, and what did they usually die from? Yeah, yeah. I think many of these individuals have, have just died. Uh, a natural death. Uh, of course, a, a disease that kills you quickly leaves no trace on the, on the bones so and teeth. So in some of these cases, yes, it could have been an infectious disease, uh, a, a pathogen of some kind that kills them quickly. In some cases, there, there are some very elderly Neanderthals. Um, we've got the famous example from Shanidar in Iraq of a Neanderthal that was crippled, probably blinded in one eye, uh, with an amputated arm, And this individual had lived for years with those disabilities. So that's incredible. I, I mean, the, this individual must have had some social support to survive that long. So that shows you there's care within the Antitol groups. Uh, and that individual in the end succumbed, uh, you know, but already middle aged. So, yeah, I mean, we can find old individuals in Neanderthals. In my view, there are more of them when we get to Homo sapiens. So I think that Homo sapiens was able to extend the life of individuals. So there is care for individuals and individuals also can support themselves. So once you have the ability to weave, and we think this was here 40,000 years ago, once you can weave, you can make nets. And once you've got nets, you can use it to catch more fish. You can use it to trap small game. Uh, and so we can imagine old people who weren't fit enough to join in the hunts anymore and run after animals, they could still go locally and maybe teach their grandchildren how to catch small game. And they can even support themselves. And so they're not a burden on the group. And also they're a store of knowledge. So those old people uh, will remember maybe the last time 30 years ago when the reindeer herds didn't come, uh, how did we survive? And they might have that knowledge. And also they're the store of knowledge of the group They will know the kinship relations. They will know how we're related to the people who live over the mountains there, that they married into our family three generations ago, and who were the people. So those old people actually would be a valuable, in the end, would be, once they're not a burden, once they can support themselves to an extent, we're trapping small game and collecting plant resources with their knowledge, they can pass that knowledge on and it's useful to the group. Not sure if I'm right with my dates here, but about 50,000 years ago, Homo sapiens acquired what's called behavioral modernity, right? Seemingly out of the blue, we become equipped with quote unquote superpowers such as abstract thought planning, trade and cooperative labor. This seems like something out of a comic book, almost like X-Men or something. If you've been reading Sapiens, yeah, that's the view you get from uh, Harari's book, Sapiens, that it's suddenly there's this explosion. Right. Uh, I think he calls it the cognitive revolution. Yeah. And, and I think that was a view that was around uh, 20, 30 years ago. And I was associated with some of it. Let's talk about a human revolution that happened. We suddenly acquired language and suddenly this gave us all this complexity. And that was how we came out of Africa and just instantly replaced all these other species. Um, it doesn't look like that anymore. Um, I think that if we look at the African record, these behaviors have a much greater time depth, some of them at least. So that behavior goes back further and further. I think language evolved much more gradually rather than suddenly like a switch coming on. Um, the Neanderthals clearly had a lot of this behavior. Uh, I think some people think that there's basically no behavioral gap anymore between us and Neanderthals. I don't go that far. I think there still are differences. And uh, in the DNA, there are signs that uh, our complexity in our brain, our, our density of neurons, for example, in the brain is higher probably than, than it is in Neanderthals. But Overall, Neanderthals, I've said how complex their behavior was. They were fully human in their behavior. Um, and so this had a long evolutionary history. Some of it was shared with Neanderthals. When we know more about Denisovans, I think we will see they also had complex lives. Um, that individual from Harbin that I mentioned. so The Dragon Man. Uh, yeah, the Dragon Man. So this fossil is at least 150,000 years old. 
and living right up in northeast China. Now, that area today has some of the coldest winters in China. They have an ice festival where they build ice sculptures that stay there for a month. So the average temperature in some of those months today is minus 15 degrees, the average winter temperature. If those people at Harbin were living under those conditions, they must have had uh, incredible adaptations to deal with that. Physically, probably their bodies were very large and very wide, probably, to conserve heat. Maybe they evolved more body hair again. But also, culturally, it's likely that they must have had good clothing, probably had the use of fire. So I think to survive in those environments for humans 150,000 years ago, you've got to give them cultural complexity to survive there. So I think this shows us that they were surviving in conditions even colder than we find Neanderthals. So I think there's a lot to learn about even the Denisovans and their and the Chinese counterparts, their cultural complexity. Okay, so there wasn't any sudden jump and then these cave paintings start to appear. I, I don't think so. I mean, the paintings that appear, of course, in Europe and the, and the lovely sculptures and things, 40,000 years old, they appear, they appear to appear suddenly, but we now know that there were cave paintings, equivalent cave paintings being done in Sumatra and Borneo 40,000 40, years ago. So either this complexity developed independently in those regions, but I think it's much more likely that it was there in the common ancestor. So in my view, and we don't have the evidence to back it yet, I think when we have evidence from Africa at 60,000 years that we can date properly, that we can assess properly, we're going to find that people in Africa were already doing that kind of art 60,000 years ago. Uh, I, I could be completely wrong about that, but my hunch is it was there, at least the seeds of it were there in the Homo sapiens that came out of Africa. This is pure speculation for the end, but um, what does the future evolution of humans look like? I'm sure you get asked this a lot. I do, yeah. That's a regular question uh, after talks. Um, <laughs> and it's difficult, if not impossible, to answer. And the problem right. is that evolution doesn't have a forward look, of course. It, it's what works now. Um, so it doesn't have a forward look about what's going to be needed in the future. Um, I mean, we can say that there are certain things which aren't going to happen. So, for example, sometimes you see these science fiction representations of little stick humans with great big brains. That's probably not going to happen because our brain sizes have actually been getting smaller in the last 20,000 years on average. So compared with our Homo sapiens ancestors, as well as Neanderthals, we've got smaller brains. And that's partly because we've got smaller bodies, and therefore our brains have scaled big with those smaller bodies. Um, so I don't think we're going to get bigger and bigger brains. And I think more significantly is the challenges we face. You know, If the climate predictions are correct, we're going to see conditions on the Earth in the next 200 years that humans have never faced. And we're going to see bigger changes in, in the direction of a hotter world than humans have ever faced. So I think the question we have to ask first is, you know, how many humans will there be on the planet in, in a few hundred years? And where will they be living? And what conditions will they be living under? That's what's going to shape their evolution. So those are huge unknowns. And I think that makes it impossible at the moment to predict our longer term evolution. And even if our species will even be here, because the fate of every species that we look at in the fossil record is that eventually they go extinct. And, you know, are we going to be an exception? Well, why should we be an exception? We'll see. Oh, it's or really maybe we hard. Won't see. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to internalize this coming down from the pedestal of, you know, feeling very special and unique. Yes, yeah, Oof. sure. And as I say, if uh, I'm going to a few drink after twists this. and turns of the evolutionary story, and we wouldn't be here. And maybe Neanderthals or Denisovans would be taking over the planet for better or worse. All right. Um, this podcast is called Eurotrash, so I have to ask you something a little bit trashy at the end. Um, is it really still an insult after all we've heard during the interview about Neanderthals? Is it still an insult to call somebody a Neanderthal? Uh, well, I would say so, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know. okay. Case settled. I mean, I would say. Yeah, Neanderthals were, you know, they, they were people of their time and our ancestors were people of their time. And if you compare our behavior, we were no better or worse than the Neanderthals. I would say if we go back 50,000 years, life was hard for these people, but Neanderthals had care and compassion 
they were not ape men. They were very evolved humans. They walked upright as well as we do. They had brains as big as ours. Their behavior was nearly as complicated as ours. So, no, I think it's not an insult. Uh, it shouldn't be an insult to call people Neanderthals. Right, uh, it shouldn't be should, an insult. We should have a positive image. Let's of change that. Yes, yeah, yeah. more justice for Neanderthals. Um, yes. Thank you so much, Professor Stringer. This was absolutely fantastic. I really hope that we get to talk just about Neanderthals maybe next time if you'll have time and if you want to do this again. Yeah. Uh, by the way, where can people um, follow your work? I think you have a Twitter account, right? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter, uh, at Chris Stringer 65 um, So, yeah, I, re- I tweet pretty regularly. Uh, there are news pieces that go on the Natural History Museum website, and we have a lot of resources there on human evolution. Uh, I have my own very modest uh, YouTube channel, not much on there at the moment. Um, but if you if you Google my name uh, and YouTube, you'll find uh, some talks I've given. So, and of course, there's books. You mentioned uh, some of them. Uh, the most recent ones, uh, Our Human Story, uh, co-authored with Louise Humphrey, which is covering the whole of human evolution. Uh, and Britain, One Million Years of the Human Story, covering the British, continent of the British story in the last one million years. And that is an amazing story, too. Maybe we can talk about that another time. Um, I would absolutely love to. Thanks again for taking the time. Great. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. Hi. Thanks for watching. Just want to give a quick shout out to my amazing patron, uh, Thea Dejman Taichi. You're awesome. Thank you so much. If you want to support Eurotrash, you can do that on Patreon. You'll find the link below. Uh, yeah. Oh, and please hit subscribe. Thanks.